So I'm going to take about uh, 18 minutes to talk about the fundamentals of needle guidance. I know that you're experienced in this, but I still feel that stressing the fundamentals goes a long way. Uh, the, the next talk will be more advanced, and then I'm giving a talk tomorrow, and that's when I'll talk about calcific tendinosis and PRP and tenotomy. So this is just a real basic uh, fundamental thing here for starters. So I'm basically going to go through the steps that I do when I, when I do a procedure. Uh, these are the, the very steps. So the first thing I, of course, I perform an ultrasound, a limited ultrasound to make sure I see the target, make sure that I see the things I don't want to hit with my needle, but also I want to make sure that there's some pathology that actually is being appropriately treated. For example, I've, when, sometimes I'm asked to inject the elasos bursa and there's a paralabo cyst, and I totally change what I do. So we got to make sure we have a diagnostic, uh, some diagnostic information. So the first question is in versus out of plane. There are two different ways of guiding your needle. In plane meaning the needle and the sound beam and the, the transistor are all parallel. It's like looking at the barrel of a gun when you're putting your needle in uh, versus out of plane where the needle crosses the ultrasound plane. I would say 99% of my procedures are in plane because it is by far the most accurate way to put your needle into a target. It's not to say that the other way doesn't work, it's just is less, less accurate, and that's why I prefer the in-plane approach. So this is the in-plane approach, where as you can see, the needle will be throughout the sound beam. So the benefit is you get to see the needle moving into real time, into your target, missing the things you want to miss. So you have control, and you know exactly where the needle is and the tip is throughout the entire procedure under real time. So for example, you see your target, and you can watch it go in. So it's, it's very rewarding. So here with a phantom, you could see I'm first moving the, tr the transistor back and forth till I center it over the needle, and then I advance the needle. And that's one side point, is I don't move the needle and the in transistor at the same time. It's like two ships passing in the night. So basically, I have the needle in, I move the transistor until the needle is in plane, I stop moving the transistor, then I move the needle. If I move the needle and I, I lose it, I stop moving the needle, because otherwise it would be a blind procedure. Then I move the transistor and find the needle again. Then I stop the transistor and then move the needle again, one and then the other. So obviously this is very accurate, seeing it go to the target. So then there's the out of plane approach or the out of plane strategy, uh, which is less accurate. And the reason is, this is what we see. And we don't know if it's this part of the needle, this part, or this part. We don't know if the needle's going up or down. The target often is not in view either. It, but there is a way to get at this, and it's called the, 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 like the stepwise approach or step ladder approach. So what we do here, this is, let's say this is your ultrasound image, and this is my needle crossing the sound beam. We err on going superficial so that when the needle passes through, you see the dot, and as soon as it passes through and you're not in your target, you want to back up and aim lower and do the same thing. So it's a little bit of trial and error. Of course, the more superficial your target, you're probably going to get it the first time. So definitely the deeper the target, the less you want to use the out-of-plane approach. But by far, again, I use the in-plane approach for almost every procedure I do. So here is an example with a phantom showing, you're going to see the needle pop into view right there. Then I back up and I go deeper. And I back up and I go deeper. And you get the idea that eventually you're going to get down to your target. But you're, there's some trial and error there. Uh, that you have to keep in mind. Always confirm in two planes, regardless of what approach, to make sure your needle isn't next to the target, but truly in the center of the target. All right, so we've decided on doing the in-plane approach. The next thing I want to do is plan my needle course. So the idea here is to pick the shortest distance from your skin to the target. You want to avoid the neurovascular structures or targets you don't want to hit, so you've got to map all that out and plan ahead. So when I'm putting a needle in, into an extremity in general, I have two general approaches. One is to go along the flat surface of the extremity, meaning proximal to distal, or along the curved side of the extremity, going from side to side. And by far, I prefer this, and it's for a number of reasons. One is I have more room to work. The second is the puncture site can be moved away from the transducer, and that will help get the needle perpendicular. And that's why I highlighted that yell. That's the most important thing you can do to see your needle, is to eliminate anisotropy. When a needle is oblique to the sound beam, just like when a tendon is oblique, the sound beam's gonna ricochet in a different direction and you'll, it won't be echogenic. 
In fact, when a needle is 45 degrees and steeper, it disappears. You just can't see it. But if it's 90 degrees, it reflects and you can see it very easily. So this is the, the most thing, important thing you can do to see your needle. Another reason why I like going from side to side is if I'm injecting around a nerve or, or around a tendon, if you have a cross section of a nerve or tendon, you can put the needle above it, next to it, or under it. Or if you're going along the tendon, you only have one choice on top. And especially if you're injecting steroids, you don't want to be depositing steroids on top of the tendon where it's close to the subcutaneous fat. So if I were injecting this extensor tendon, I would do this. Go from one of these sides. I would put the needle actually between the tendon and bone to get away from the subcutaneous fat. If I went this way, I only had one choice. Unless I go through the tendon, which I wouldn't do, I would inject over. So that's why I wouldn't do that approach. All right, so now the next step is, you know, what transducer do I use? Well, in general, most procedures we use will be a linear transducer. Here's a larger footprint. The hockey stick is great when you're around the, the smaller parts. I will use a curved linear transducer around the hip. I like the larger field of view, especially given the depth of the targets here being a hip joint injection. As you know, when you hold the transducer, and you, you know this already, that you need to anchor the transducer onto the patient with putting your hand on the patient or your pinky, stabilizing it. And the reason why that's important for intervention is that when you are holding the transducer over the needle and you can't see the needle, it's like, how can I not see the needle? Remember that the, the beam is focused. That's why there are focal zones either that are set automatically or you set yourself. So to get that needle in that focal zone, you have to move the transducer only a very little at a time. By anchoring the transducer on the patient with your hand, you can allow that micro movement. For people who are just gaining their experience with needles and transducers and ultrasound, one error I see is that they move too fast. It's like, okay, there's the needle, where is it? And they, just, they, just, they move, and of course you just can't see it. So anchoring the probe, the transducer and the patient will allow these small, measure, the small movements. And as I put here, usually I hold the needle in your good hand, and hopefully you have a good hand, and the transducer in your not so good hand, not your bad hand. But one thing is if you use the, like a barrel of a, like a gun approach, uh, every procedure is your good hand because you're just pivoting on your chair, deciding which way to go, and you can always use whatever hand you need. You're never going like from side to side if you're doing this. So that's usually how I do these. Next thing is needle selection. Now with the in-plane approach, you don't want your needle to bend. So for the deeper structures like the hip or the shoulder, I use a 20 gauge needle. For more superficial, 22. For the hand and the foot, I use a 25. But I don't want to use a 25 gauge needle if I'm going really deep where the needle might bend. Because the needle's bent, it'll never be in plane. So I want the needle to stay uh, in plane. Okay, this whole bit about using a trocar. So here's the uh, outer cannula, and here's the inner trocar. People who say it's good to use a needle with an inner trocar or a stylet is that it pierces tissues <coughs> within ticking cores of it. And where that comes into play is when you are trying to aspirate something and you can't get anything out. So where I use a trocar is when I'm aspirating complex joint fluid or when I'm doing calcific tendinosis. Those are the only two situations where I use a trocar. Because if I'm just injecting steroids in a joint, if there's a little plug of tissue, it's going to come out when I inject, so I don't, I don't mind it. Another problem with the trocar is it adds several steps and is very cumbersome to the procedures. Let me explain. If I had a needle with a stylet or a trocar in my transducer and I put my needle down to the target, I have to set my transducer down, take out the trocar, hook up my syringe, get the needle again. So it's, a, it's never, several steps where the needle can move and it's just bothersome. Another problem with the trocar is that when you take that out, that needle's filled with air. And the first thing you inject, you're gonna get a big blob of air and you're gonna shadow everything. So what I do if I use a trocar, I'll get it near my target, take out the trocar, inject some Lido or something to get the air out, and then go down to my target. I remember I was doing a PRP of an ulnar collateral ligament with a trainee, and uh, we got right where we wanted to, took out the trocar and started to inject, and just boom, it was all white, and you couldn't see a darn thing. I'm like. I, I think it went well. Every, every story ends that way. Uh, so I don't use a trocar for injections because what I do now is after I, after I anesthetize the skin with a skin wheel, I have my cocktail, steroids, whatever, 
hooked up to the needle, I just go down to the target, I inject. I'll put the transistor down and I'll flush the needle so steroids aren't deposited out. But the main thing is I just go down and inject and, and get the goods in as quick as possible. Okay, so three more steps here to finish this. Uh, we've decided all these things. The next thing we want to do is mark the skin before we sterilize the area. So marking the skin, you can use different types of pens like this one here. Sorry. So uh, what I tend to do is I put an X where the needle's going to go. I put a line where the other side of the transducer is. That way I know the entire area to clean and I can put the transducer back in the same plane. I don't have to reinvent the, the wheel. By the way, I do wear gloves and I use a probe cover and this is not a needle. This is for demonstration purposes only. Now what about sterile technique? I've seen the whole spectrum of this. What I can tell you is what I do is I use a probe cover and I use a, a towel with or a, 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 a drape that has a portal so that everything is clean. I could set the transducer down on, on the drape if I need to. And that practice is what is recommended to minimize any infection. Now I've seen the other end of the spectrum where they'll have a clean hand and a dirty hand. Uh, the clean hand will be with the, with the needle and the dirty hand will be with the transducer. Thinking that we're gonna keep these two separated in space and if they are indeed separated, that this is effective. But if you touch that needle or that sterile, even that sterile gel touches um, the non-sterile probe and near that puncture site, it will contaminate. And that has been proven in the literature that a sterile puncture site with a semi-sterile probe, meaning that the probe doesn't have a cover but there's sterile gel, contamination can be expected. Then there's all in between where they put something over the probe uh, that's somewhat sterile I'm not saying what you should do. I can tell you what is the best practice, what I mentioned. But one thing to keep in mind, if something goes wrong, you will be held to the standard of your colleagues, the people in your clinic, and in your hospital. So if you are doing something different from everyone else, you're gonna, you might be in trouble if something goes, goes wrong. And I can tell you that we get about one infection of a joint every eight years or so. Those odds are good. And we looked at the cases when they, they occur, We've done everything right, so sometimes it's just bad luck or who knows what. And when that happens, you're held to a standard and you have to say exactly what you did in your practice. So you decide what's right for you, but I'm just saying what I recommend to minimize uh, any infection. So this is uh, one way of doing it. This was actually a biopsy we were doing with drapes and the, the sterile probe cover. You can set stuff down and you don't have to worry about that. Now I know uh, probe covers cost money, uh, but so be it. Uh, and I've heard people say, well, I don't have an assistant to help with the probe cover. Well, you don't need an assistant. If you can set the, the transducer up in, in the stand like that, you put non-sterile gel here, and then you open up your tray, you know, after you mark your skin, you drop everything, you anesthetize the area, you open the probe cover, and you just reach down like I'm doing here, and then you grab it and pick it up. It, it's, you can do it all by yourself. You don't need an assistant. I always put this on last because once you have the uh, transducer that's sterile, I, I don't want to put it down. I've seen sometimes I, one of my trainings put it on the patient and it started to fall and the patient grabbed it, you know, or the patient, you know, you just, it's one thing you got to keep an eye on. So I put the transducer cover on last. Ergonomics, very important here. I tend to sit when I do a procedure because it depends how tall you are and your vision and everything else. I find I have more motor control when my elbows are near me and like this. You want the monitor to be within maybe 45 degrees at best. If it's behind you or like this, you are going to mess up your back and you'll make a, an easy procedure very difficult at times. I have to tell the story where I, I learned this the hard way. I was doing, well, I did this procedure. I was injecting the ostrigonum and I think I was in a hurry and the table was too low and I said, oh, this is gonna be easy, I'll just do this. You know, that's jinxing myself right there. It took a while to find, to get it in and everything. The next morning I was walking down the hallway and I kept scuffing my foot. And I thought there was something on my shoe. And then I got in my car and when I hit the gas, I couldn't take my foot off the gas. So I developed acute foot drop the day after the procedure. It took about six weeks to go away. I think it went away. Yeah, it went away. <laughs> so, I don't, so I learned the hard way, even though I teach this, that you gotta have it 
exactly how you want it. We have a secondary monitor on the wall so that when I'm doing a foot, I can look up here, or here I can look at the machine. So that's just another luxury item. The last thing to finish this, how do you see the needle? So what I recommend is when you're putting the needle into the patient, to first only put the needle in into the silky fat or a small amount. And the reason is the deeper the needle, the harder it is to redirect the needle. It's going through fascial planes and muscle, and it's not going, it's going to just go right to the same path. So I find if I put the needle in just in the sub-Q fat, put the transducer down, this is my chance to make sure everything is exactly how I want it before I commit to that trajectory. In fact, if you put the, the needle in and the transducer down and you don't see your target, it's very easy to simply pivot the transducer on your puncture site till you get your target in line. And with that needle only in the sub-Q fat, you can move it like this. They don't feel a darn thing because there's really hardly any nerve endings under the skin. So this is my chance to get everything lined up, then I can advance the needle down to my target. I do not anesthetize between the skin and the target. If you're purposeful and you, you're efficient, you don't need to do that. So that's how I go about my procedures. Even when I do an arthrogram under fluoroscopy, I only put in the sub-Q fat. I don't commit until I know it's exactly how I want it. If I have to put another skin wheel and move it over, so be it. So don't advance the needle unless you can see the entire needle. That, you know, I know I've seen people where, oh, I can't see the needle, I'm just going to keep advancing, hopefully I'll see it. That's becoming a blind procedure, forget that. If you don't see the, the needle, stop moving it. Move the transducer until you see the needle, then move the needle. Don't move the needle and the transducer at the same time. If you see this image, okay, I see the needle, but this is not adequate. It's like our skis are crossed. You want to see the entire needle to the tip. So how do you correct this? Simple, you look down on the patient and you'll see that your needle and your transducer are crisscross. You just turn the transducer. Or if the needle's in the sub fat, you could just move the needle because in the fat, it can move very easily. Now let's say you can't see the needle, everything is going well, but if it's too steep, of course, because of anisotropy, it can be difficult. Well, you could use a coated needle. Those cost money, that's what that is. But the two maneuvers I do, Jiggle the needle and rotate the needle. Let me explain what that is. So by jiggling the needle, it's like you have an intention tremor where it's, or too much caffeine where you just do this a little bit. And what will happen is the tissues will, will move and that will help bring your eyes to it. And then the other thing is rotating. So let's say I see the needle, but where's the end of it? If you rotate, the bevel will make a flash. So let me show you the video clip here. First, I'm going to jiggle the needle. There's my intention tremor. And now I'm going to rotate. And you'll see the bevel somewhat flash. So the jiggle rotate, even when it's that steep, will help you identify uh, the needle. But the most important thing, what I said earlier, if you can get that needle 90 degrees, you're going to see it better. I just showed that. So look at the difference here, oblique and 90 degrees, night and day. And that's why we try to get that, which means when I'm planning my procedure, I could move my needle puncture site to the side, or during the procedure, I could move my probe over here, and that's why I make sure I clean the area well enough where I have that luxury of moving the transducer around. Get it to 90 degrees, and that's gonna be the most helpful thing. This is in a, uh, a phantom, that's not a real person, but you can see that it's getting brighter with reverberation when we hit 90 degrees. Some machines have beam steering. It's a luxury item. I forget to turn it on. Usually just by jiggling and rotating, I work through it, but you could try beam steering, and that can help. Hitting one button, the beam is now perpendicular. So it's worth a shot. The last thing is this issue, the issue of putting a needle into a very superficial structure. The problem with that is by the time the needle gets into the skin, you're either in the target, through it, or you missed it. And it's too late. So this is why this concept of a sterile gel standoff is important. So what you do is you heap up sterile gel and lift up the end of the transducer. You can actually watch the needle going through the gel under real time, because if your target's here, you'll be, able to see, you'll be able to move the needle in the gel and then go down to your target. And I tend to use this for the hands and the feet uh, when the targets are very superficial. All right. So that is the end of what I'm going to talk about. Any questions on just this general uh, technique while we switch out the computers here?